Okay, so Stefano and Zé and uh, Matheus, do you think it's a good time to start? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, very good. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, sorry for the uh, late start. We are five minutes late, but no problem. So let me let me first you uh, make an announcement, uh, and actually it is related to the organization of this school and workshop. So as you know, uh, ICTP is uh, one of its uh, goals is to foster mathematics in developing countries of which Brazil is part of. So I discussed a lot with Stefano Luzzato ways to, to try to, to make this development, especially in the region that I come from and I work, which is in the Northeast of Brazil. And one of the ways that we found was exactly by making this event. And another way was uh, trying to, to select people for postdoctoral positions that could work here and also have transit at ICTP. So I would, I would like to advertise a postdoctoral position. So I'm sending here the link uh, that is uh, paid, that is funded by Instituto Serra Pilheira. And this postdoctoral position is for people in dynamics here in, in my university. And they will also be allowed to have an extended visit at ICTP. As a matter of fact, the link that I sent you has two jobs. One of them is in dynamics, funded by Serra Pilheira, and there is another one in differential geometry, also funded by Serra Pilheira. But I should focus that the extended visit is only intended for those applying for the dynamics position. Okay, so you can find further details in this link. So another, uh, uh, another above, on top of uh, having this uh, postdoctoral position, we also decided to have this school and workshop on the field of non-uniform hyperbolicity, which is the field that we both, both work and on which dynamics is focusing a lot in the past years. So there are two uh, important techniques in order to understand non-uniform hyperbolicity. And they are Markov partitions and Young Towers. Markov partitions, they were developed in the dynamical perspective in the late 60s and early 70s of last century by Sinai, Adler, Weiss, Ratner, Bowen, and others. And Young Towers, they were uh, introduced with uh, success by Young in, in the 90s and then later developed by Chernov and other people. So our idea was exactly to try to present these two techniques and their developments, their very recent developments, to allow uh, students, postdoctors, post and also professors to learn these two tools and to compare them. So in the past three weeks, we had two mini courses, one given by myself and another given by Jose Alves, which was, uh, I presented the Markov partitions perspective and Jose Alves presented the Young Towers perspective and everything was recorded so you can find on YouTube all the videos. So this was the part of the school on the event. And now we arrive at the part of the workshop. So this workshop uh, will finish the, the activities of this event. We, we always meet in this week at the same time slot, which in Italy is from 2 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. In Brazil, on which many people are in the audience, is from 10 p.m. to 12.30, 10 a.m., sorry, to 12.30 uh, p.m. And uh, we will have two talks every day. And today we will have uh, Carlos Mateus and Yakov Pessin. So uh, it is a Pleasure to, to introduce in Carlos Mateus, which uh, works at CNRS and the Cole Polytechnic. And Mateus will talk about young towers on non-positively curved surfaces. Thank you, Mateus. 
Um, yeah, thank you, Yuri, uh, Stefano, and Zé uh, for organizing the event and inviting me to talk here. So it was a lot of fun following the mini courses uh, on YouTube. And uh, yeah, I hope you have fun also uh, uh, seeing my talk. So yeah, as Yuri said, I'm going to talk about uh, the aspect uh, related to Zé's course, which is Young Towers and the Key of Correlations in the specific case of uh, non-positively covered surfaces. And everything that I'm going to talk about is joint work with uh, Yuri Lima and Ian Melbourne. So uh, before entering into the subject, let me quickly uh, show you the plan for the talk. So the plan is to recall you something about uh, what is known about uh, ergodic theory in negative curvature. So it's a classical talk, but it's always good to uh, refresh your memory. Uh, then I will start uh, uh, talking about uh, non-positive curvature uh, for surfaces and what was known prior to our result, which is uh, basically a result of constructing young towers and obtaining uh, statistical laws, in particular the key of correlations and central limit theorems for a particular class of uh, non-positive covered surface. And then in the final part of the talk, I'm going to explain the proof of the result. Not everything because there are many aspects to this proof, but at least the main, some uh, what we could call the main ideas. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so let's start. So uh, for me, uh, S will be always a Riemannian manifold. Uh, so finite volume always. Uh, I'm not considering infinite volume here. Uh, yeah, dimension at least two, and coming with a Riemannian metric. <laughs> Uh, and I'm doing that to not mix up the manifold with the phase space of the geodesic flow. So GT for me will be the geodesic flow, which is a flow taking a place in the unit tangent bundle or cotangent bundle, depends on your <laughs> preference. Um, and then just to uh, make things clear, I'm going to denote by mu Liouville measure. So the Lebesgue measure on these. Uh, Riemannian manifold, which is invariant under this flow. And I'm going to call M for the phase space of the geodesic flow, so the unit tangent bundle. So S for me would be the surface, but as everybody knows, the geodesic flows take place really on the unit tangent bundle. So it takes place on M, okay? Uh, now, uh, what people, uh, well, the history of uh, analyzing uh, ergodic properties of geodesic flows has a long history. So, of course, we should uh, pay tribute to the work of Hopf in 39. Uh, and Hopf, in a seminal work, introduced what people call today the Hopf argument to prove that the geodesic flows on surface of, neg of compact surfaces of negative curvature, they are ergodic. And as I told you, this is what people now call Hopf's argument. And the idea is that basically he studied a big of average along invariant manifolds. So he noticed that basically forward big of invariant uh, average are uh, constant along stable manifolds and similarly for past big of average along unstable manifolds. And then he used a kind of Fubini streak, uh, <clears throat> which was possible because the foliations, the invariant foliations are C1 in this setting. And so by combining these two uh, arguments, he was able to prove ergodicity so that functions which are invariant are constant almost everywhere. Uh, but this, property of having uh, C1 uh, invariant foliations is very strong. And in particular, it was discovered by Anosov that it, it almost never works in higher dimensions in some sense. But in any case, uh, several years later, so in his thesis in 69, Anosov noticed that uh, actually to run out the second part of the argument, you don't need the full strength of C1 irregularity. You just need to know that uh, the foliations are absolutely continuous. So to apply this Fubini's argument, just need this uh, weaker property, which hopefully, which luckily holds uh, in our setting. So thanks to dynamics, the foliations, which are usually just holder, they are holder plus this extra absolute continuity property, which is sufficient to conclude. So yeah, thanks to dynamics, we don't have arbitrary holder foliations, but a special kind of foliations. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, uh, another regularity discussion will come up in our setting when I, you discuss our work with Yuri and Melbourne. 
but it's not it's not exactly this kind of uh, regularity but it's interesting that there is always a kind of regularity discussion that we should make when talking about these statistical properties but this is the context in negative curvature uh, next uh, once we know that the flows are ergodic and actually mixing it's not hard to see you can ask uh, about the speed of mixing so <clears throat> in other words you look at the correlation functions so for instance you could think of these functions here phi and psi to be characteristic functions and then this would be just the probability that uh, mu uh, the, 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 the probability that uh, the intersection of a and gtb uh, minus the probability of a and probability of b this goes to zero so basically how how fast these things decorrelate when apply the flow to one of the sets and um, <clears throat> this uh, speed well it goes to zero because of the mixing property uh, and then you can ask for rates of decay at least if you pick observables which are smooth i mean it's known that if you if you pick arbitrary observables then even the best chaotic systems have slow decay for uh, arbitrary observables. You can always cook up very tricky observables, making this decay very slow. But if you look at, uh, say, C1 or C infinity observables, then there is a hope to pick up some speed here. And um, actually, you can ask, well, why you are interested in these questions of decay of correlations? Well, it's a natural mathematical question once you see mixing, but not only that, it has applications outside dynamics. So in particular, it was used by Eskin Macmillan in the 90s to count uh, integral points in, in algebraic varieties, special types of algebraic varieties. So in, in other words, you can use uh, exponential mixing to, to, to count uh, things. Uh, it was used in 98, uh, so Eski Macmillan, I think it was from 1993. Kleinbach Margulis is from 98. They also use that to solve problems of, uh, I mean, Diophantine problems, trying to pick up uh, Diophantine vectors inside analytic manifolds. And the method to pick up these Diophantine properties along manifolds was to use exponential mixing and the distribution properties. And more recently in 2012, if I remember correctly, Exponential mixing for the frame flow was used to build surface subgroups inside uh, hyperbolic, inside the pi one of the mental group of three manifolds. And this is the work of Ken and Markovich. And the list continues, but I'm not going to mention that. So the message here is that rates of mixing are important not only for, say, intrinsic beauty of mathematics, but also has applications to number theory and geometry and so forth. Okay, but let's get back to mixing. I'm not going to mention application of mixing, but just how to prove some results. And in this direction, I want to say that uh, the in, in, 87, in, in 87, Marina Hatner got a very precise exponential mixing result, but in the case of hyperbolic surface, so constant negative curvature. And her idea was to use what people call a Bargmann's classification of unitary representations of SHR. So basically the idea is that um, from the spectral gap that you get on the Laplacian of the surface, you can convert that into a isolation property from the trivial representation. And this basically converts into a decay of correlations. Uh, but of course, this theory is very algebraic, so uses uh, representation theory of asset you are. And so there is little chance that this kind of arguments extend to variable negative curvature. That's the point. <clears throat> but much later, um, Chernoff was developing a method which uh, he called at the time a mark of approximations, which actually was, he started developing these methods together with uh, Bunimovich and Sinai for billiards. But then he wrote in 98 a paper on geodesic flows. And he introduced this technology of what he called Markov approximations, which was a kind of a, a pre Yang Tower, somehow, if you wish. And then a condition called non uniform integrability of defoliations to derive a stretched exponential mixing for certain uh, geodesic flows in negative curvature. Okay, so stretched means that this is the case at the uh, uh, not exponential rate, but exponential minus the square root of t, basically. 
Okay. And then uh, famously, uh, the Gopiat was able to go from stretched exponential to true exponential uh, using uh, what people call today uh, the Gopiat estimates, which uh, you can summarize in one phrase. I mean, uh, of course, this is a kind of disrespectful to the Gopiat because I'm trying to summarize his beautiful work in one phrase. But if I had to do that, uh, I would say that it's applying uh, Van der Korput lemma to temporal functions. So basically, he wants to pick up. Uh, oscillations in the Laplace transform of the correlation functions. So you look at this correlation here as a function of time. You apply Laplace transform and then you try to get constellations in the kind of Fourier or other Laplace expansion. And to get this constellation, you apply this idea of uh, that the non integrability translates into a, a beautiful oscillation along the temporal functions. And you, you use a classical lemma due to von der Korput telling when exponential uh, integrals or sums exhibit constellations. Okay. Uh, and then, I mean, of course, once we got this result uh, for exponential mixing uh, for another systems, for a class of another systems, then, I mean, everybody got excited and there, there was a, a huge literature what was developed after that. I'm not going to mention everybody, so I'm sorry uh, if I'm not mentioning your work today, but uh, I would like to mention just a, a few names uh, on this direction because the literature is, is huge. But let me mention that Liverani was able to uh, uh, extend the Gopiat's work for another, another uh, contact another flows. <clears throat> Uh, and more recently, at Suji and Zhang announced a solution to the so-called Bowen uh, well conjecture, saying that uh, if you have in three dimensions this time, so you have a compact three-dimensional manifold, you have another flow on it, and then uh, you can improve topological mixing into exponential mixing. So it's a kind of funny that topological property implies into a quantitative property, and this is for all equilibrium measures for holder potential. So. Maximum entropy measures, uh, Liouville measures, yeah, all, all of them, all interesting measures. Okay, so this is the scenario for a negative curvature. Uh, now I'm going to uh, add some zero curvature in my manifold. And so again, the setup is S now for me to be a compact surface with non negative curvature. Uh, M is the phase space of the geodesic flow. Mu is the Liouville measure for me. Uh, GT is the, the geodesic flow, sorry. And then I'm going to denote, I've been given a, a, a vector. I'm going to denote gamma xt, the geodesic generated by this direction. And then I'm going to define the degenerate set to be the set of vectors along generating geodesics along which the curvature vanishes identically, okay? And then the regular set will be the complement of that. Um, <clears throat> now, I want to uh, tell you why uh, a gadget called Jacobi fields are interesting when talking about geodesic flows. Uh, so you probably know this, but let me remind quickly what is the rationality behind this consideration. So the idea is the following. What is a Jacobi field? So a Jacobi field is you have a geodesic and then you have vectors along the, this geodesic, which are these vectors GT. And then the, it's a vector field satisfying this equation here. And so it's a little bit bizarre if you present it like that. A better way is to say the following. You start with a geodesic and now you consider one parameter variations of the geodesic by other geodesics, okay? So now I have two parameters, I have a family which is gamma t comma s, okay? So t is the parameter along the geodesic and s is another geodesic. And now if you derive the variation at each point of the initial geodesic, you get a vector field and the vector field, because of the condition that the variation is by other geodesics, satisfies this equation. So that's the point. This equation here characterizes the fact that you are doing variations by other geodesics. So in other words, we, what you are trying to do is understand how uh, geodesics are uh, behaving nearby a given one that you are interested in. 
In particular, if you use these variations of geodesics to parameterize the tangent space to the unit tangent bundle, <clears throat> then uh, you can do it. You can make an identification of, I mean, a, a variation. I mean, by definition, a tangent vector to a, a geodesic is a variation, an infinitesimal variation of the geodesic, which we saw that it's identified with these Jacobi fields. And the advantage is that in these coordinates, the derivative of the geodesic flow is very simple. It's just, uh, you start at the initial point zero, and then you just flow for time t, and you look at what fields you got. Okay, so these are coordinates which uh, make the analysis of the geodesic flow very easy. And so let me just remark that, uh, I mean, the manifold was at the surface is a Riemannian manifold. And since it's a Riemannian manifold, the unit tangent bundle is also a Riemannian manifold. It carries a metric, which is called the Sasaki metric, which is very simple. And then I'm going to compute what happens to uh, sizes of uh, vectors in a positive derivative with, with respect to this metric. And if I do that, uh, <clears throat> well, I, I'm going to do that along two subspaces, which are the stable and unstable subspaces, which by definition are the initial points. I mean, this is a second order of the, so to give, uh, so to determine a solution, I need uh, initial position and velocity. So this is why I'm putting G and G prime. So given this guy, I have a Jacobi field. And now I'm looking at, uh, so the stable space is the space of Jacobi fields, which never, which stays bounded when I go forward. And the unstable one is the space of Jacobi fields, which stay bounded going backwards. And these spaces, they are nice because you can check by this simple formula that they are invariant on the geodesic flow. I mean, if I'm bounded forward, if I just go a little bit, uh, keep this property. <laughs> Uh, in our situation of non-positive curvature, they are one-dimensional. Uh, and they depend continuously on uh, the point, okay? And more importantly, they coincide if and only if, so I see a tangency between these spaces, if and only if I'm sitting on the degenerate set. Otherwise, they are perfect splitting if I add the flow direction, okay? Moreover, I can quickly compute, as I told you, the derivative of the geodesic flow along these spaces with respect to the Sasaki metric. And then I get, well, after some computation, I get some function here, which I wrote the basic property. So these are, there are functions U plus minus, which are continuous functions, which vanish only at the degenerate set. And the by compactness of my surface, this, this term here is bounded. So if you forget about this bounded term, what you see is just exponential of the integral of this function along a geodesic trajectory. So if this function is positive, so if you are away from the degenerate set, this function has a, a, a lower bound. And in particular, you are integrate exponential of some constant times t at least. So you see exponential growth along Yes, if you are away from that. Similarly, this function is negative away from DAG. So you see exponential contraction along the stable direction. So in other words, this simple calculation shows that you, these spaces are really deserve to be called stable and stable subspaces. If you, because if you are away from DAG, you are really seeing exponential contraction and expansion. The only problem is that when you get close to DAG, these directions tend to close up with that tangencies. <clears throat> okay, so this is the situation. And now uh, let me remind you that there is a, a beautiful application of Pessin's theory by Pessin himself from 77, which explores uh, these features of these bundles to show the following result that if the measure of the degenerate set is uh, zero with respect to the uh, Liouville measure, then the geodesic flow is ergodic. Okay, <clears throat> this is uh, basically one of, uh, I mean, an important application of the theory of a non-uniform hyperbolic system developed by Pessin. Uh, much later, uh, Knieper considered other measures. So in particular, he considered the measure of maximal entropy and he proved that 
uh, there is a unique measure of maximum entropy in my context if I'm rank one. In this context, it just means that the regular set is non-empty because I'm talking about surfaces. And more recently, uh, even more recently, uh, there, there was a series of works by uh, Le Drapier, Lim and Sarig on one hand and Bern, Burns, Clement, Haga, Fisher and Thompson, establishing many results about these, uh, these types of measures of, uh, I mean, equilibrium states in general. So we start establishing in particular uniqueness and Bernoulicity, which is kind of the top, uh, the, the, the strongest abstract ergodic theoretical property that you can ask for in the chain of ergodicity, mixing, K property and Bernoulicity. Bernoulicity is kind of the strongest one and they could establish these results in this context for certain equilibrium states. Uh, I'm not going to give precise statements here, but I, I recommend reading the papers for precise statements. Uh, but in all in all, uh, these results, uh, yeah, so the advance, of course, the knowledge about statistical properties of these flows, but once you get to this state, then you can ask the same question that people asked when uh, <clears throat> and also proved mixing, so, which is what about the key of correlations for these flows? And uh, well, this was not so well understood. And so the idea of the next uh, result, which is, as I told you, joint work with uh, Yuri Lim and Leo Melber, is to offer some polynomial mixing statement for, for a certain class of surfaces with non-positive coverage. So the result is the following. So you take S to be the surface that you get by, first you take this function here, so say set R equals to four. So this means that you're taking the profile on the plane y equals one plus x to the power four in an interval. So you draw the graph and now you make a revolution about the axis. And now you glue to make this surface boundaryless, you glue two negatively curved surfaces on the boundaries to close up the picture. And then this is my surface. So this surface, I'm going to explain to you in a moment that it has negative curvature everywhere except at the geodesic in the middle, corresponding to the revolution at the parameter x equals to zero. Okay. And so this has this surface has curvature which is non-zero except along one single closed geodesic. And in this context, uh, what we can prove sorry, Mateus. Yes. Mateus. Sorry, just to visualize, this is like two balls that are glued in a point. Or uh, no, visualize? I'm going to show a picture later. It's like two okay. tori. Yeah, it's like two okay. tori because I want to have in the end at least genus two. Yeah, because you, you start getting hyperbolic metrics, say in the torus could, with could you boundary. show the picture now so that we understand? Yeah, I can, I can show the picture now. Yeah, before getting the results, let me show the picture now. Yeah, so this is the picture. So this is the profile of revolution that I, I told you. I mean, it's this is supposed to be the curve one plus x to the power four. And then there is the x here. I'm rotating about it. And then I'm going to things of negative curvature just to cap it and make something with dot boundary. OK. So this is the kind of surface that we can treat. Uh, yeah, recently we think we can treat more things, but let me just keep to a simple statement. So let, let's take this example, which is very concrete. Um, and then the result is that uh, in this context, uh, the presence of that single uh, geodesic along which you have zero curvature uh, makes the rate of mixing to drop from, from exponential to polynomial with a rate which depends on the profile. Okay, so it's this number. So the, the precise relation between the, the exponent in the profile and the rate of mixing is given by this function, r plus two over r minus two, okay? <clears throat> but in particular, since I'm varied between four and infinity, I'm getting something between one and three, okay? So I get cu cubic decay at r equals to four. And if r increases, my profile gets flatter and flatter somehow. And the speed gets closer and closer to linear. That's the morality here. And uh, there is a work in progress by Bruin, Melbourne, and Tertiary saying that this rate should be almost optimal in the sense that uh, in the same context, there should be, it should be possible to construct uh, uh, observables with, whose correlations are not very far from this rate up to some logarithmic term. But uh, this work, is, as far as I know, uh, it's not on archive yet, but uh, yeah, 
you know, I heard from Ian that uh, this work is in progress and exists. And so presumably the optimal, I mean, the, the, the exact rate should be about this thing here. Maybe with some logs, some little powers, I don't know, but about that. Okay, so this is the result. Another result that we can get from the same, uh, from the same arguments is a central limit theorem. So I'm just recalling what it means. It's convergence in distribution to a normal distribution of this kind of average when I normalize by the square root. Uh, we also can get weak invariance principles, etc. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about all these results, but the idea is that the same machinery gives everything. And of course, if you follow the course by Z, you know that uh, all, these kind of, all these statistical laws are going to follow from a nice young tower once we get the hands on a nice young tower. And so that's what we are going to discuss now. It's how to get young towers for this geodesic flow in this context. And you can believe me, once we have that, it's not hard to get a polynomial mixing, central limit theorem, et cetera. Okay. Okay, so are there any questions? Um, yes, let's sit down and take a, a, a coffee. <clears throat> okay, so if not, let me uh, advance. So let, let me try to explain what we are going to do uh, to get this young tower. So before that, let me compare with the situation for billiards. So actually it's funny because there is a paper from 2005 by Chernoff and Zeng where they kind of consider almost the same scenario, but for billiards. So the idea is the following. You start with a dispersing billiard, but then you modify one of the obstacles to have a profile, which is exactly one plus X to the power R. And then you put two of them, one in front of the other. And so this makes a, a periodic orbit of period two, where you have this kind of neutral behavior because the curvature is going to zero. And they could prove things for the map, but as far as I understand, you can have results for the semi-flow, but not for the flow. Okay, so the analogous results for billiards are uh, open as far as I know. I mean, at least that, that's what was said in a paper from, by, by Melbourne in 2018. And I think the situation has not changed since then. But yeah, it's, it's funny because for the same geometry for billiards, we know some things, but not everything. Yeah, but for, for, for the geodesic flows, we could do something. <clears throat> okay, so let me uh, get that I showed. So this is the picture of the surface. And as I told you, it's not hard to see that, I mean, this geodesic here for this profile has uh, the, curve, the Gaussian curvature is zero. So actually I have formulas for this thing. So you can, you can check, for instance, these formulas in uh, Ducarmo's book, Manfredo Ducarmo's book. It's a very nice book on differential geometry. And so we can look at the chapter on surface of revolution. And so what Ducarmo says is that if you have a surface, which is the evolution of some profile function Xi, and then you put cosine theta, sine theta to do the revolution. Then the curvature is going to is going to be given by this formula here. So it has some second derivatives in the numerator, and then something which is non-zero in the denominator. And in particular, you see that well, <clears throat> the function one plus x to the power four has derivative zero at x equals to zero. And so the curvature is exactly there, but not uh, nearby. Also, another thing that we're going to use is uh, Claire Rowe's coordinates. So there is a very nice remark by Claire Rowe when people was trying to study geodesics on Earth, uh, which is a remark that on surface of revolutions, you have these uh, uh, meridians, which are the circles. And then the remark by Claire Rowe is that when you look at the geodesics moving on the surface and you measure the angles, with respect to the meridians, then the profile times the cosine of the angle is a constant of motion. So it's an integral of motion. And so this is particularly useful for us because it allows to reduce easily a second order differential equation, which is the equation for geodesics into a pair of uh, first order equations, which are easier to estimate. <clears throat> and this is why we chose these examples first, because at some point we need very precise estimates. I'm going to tell where. But the idea is that uh, the analysis of the Clairaut's equations, we can decompose. Well, we can first check that the DAG set is just that geodesic in the middle. 
the curvature vanish only there. And also that when you are trying to understand geodesics, which enter this kind of neck, which is the region that uh, where I have this evolution profile, I'm going to call it neck. When you enter the neck there, you can do three things. Either you can aspire and converge to the geodesic in the middle. So I'm going to call this profile asymptotic. So I'm, I'm in the stable or unstable manifold of this closed geodesic. Uh, or I can do what I call what we call bouncing movement, which is just you enter the neck, you spiral around, but then you change your mind and get out by the same part of the neck that you came from. Or you can cross, you spiral across the middle geodesic and you go out by the other side. So I'm going to, to show you. And these three behaviors correspond to a certain value of the Clairvaux constant. Okay. So these are the pictures. So we can either come here and spiral around if the clear row constant is one. If it's bigger than one, then you change your mind at some point and go back and get out by the side or you cross the geodesic effectively and go out here. Okay. And so now what I'm going to do is the following. Um, I'm not going to construct myself the young tower. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that the Chernoff and co-authors, so Markarian and Zhang notably, work on a set of geometric conditions, which I'm going to call today Chernoff axioms, which is a set of geometric axioms that allows you to uh, ensure the existence of young towers with exponential tails. And then once we get that, we can uh, take advantage of the theory of young towers and conclude the statistical laws that I announced. So the key idea here is, is really to stick to Chernoff's uh, axioms, which are a kind of geometric gadget, allowing you to ensure the existence of young towers. So he worked hard to show that these axioms implies the existence of young towers. So I'm not going to uh, reinvent the wheel. I'm just going to use these results. And so what are these axioms? These axioms are basically, um, yeah, so, Yes. Sorry, Sorry Matthias, can I ask you another question? So sure. at, at, at which stage do you do you go from the ergodic properties of the Young Tower to the flow? I mean, which... Yeah, I'm, I'm going in the very end because actually the idea is that I'm going to construct a, a nice section to be able to check for the map first. And then I have to analyze what happens to the return time to the section. And it's then that uh, I'm going to get uh, polynomial mixing. It's because so, of the returns. So the moment everything you're talking about is you're going to, so when you say Chernoff's axioms, these are axioms for the flow. For the map, for the map. They are, they are axioms for a map. No, they're axioms to, that will give the existence of the map, but, but they're axioms on the flow or they're axioms? No, they are, no. They are axioms on a given map. I mean, you, you, you have a map from a surface and then it's a list of eight axioms. I'm going to show some of them. Okay. And then if you check those axioms for a surface map, I mean, it's not the, to be surface, okay. but more okay to be a surface map. Okay. Uh, okay. Then this guy has a young tower with exponential tails. Okay. And then there is the problem of passing this information to the suspension. Yeah, and then we have to discuss, of course, return times to the section. Okay, okay, thank you. Yes. yes. And in our case, it's it, this part of the return time is not very difficult because we are dealing with contact flows. So the kind of uni condition that appears in Dogopiat's work and Chernoff's work is automatic here. So this is why I, I'm not talking too much about the return time function because we are contact flow, so because we are geodesic. So yeah, the, the kind of uniform non-integrability of foliations is kind of automatic in our setting. Yeah, but I'm going to mention these two things in the end, I hope. Yeah, but the idea is that we are going to first to construct a very nice map and then try to check these axioms and then understand the return times. And so what we do, uh, yeah, so as I was telling you, uh, we don't need to check too much we don't need to care too much about the suspension function because we are in a flow, in a setting where the flow is very nice, it's contact. Okay, so what are these axioms? So these axioms are uh, a list of uh, usual properties in dynamics, which is uniform hyperbolicity, uh, 
curvature bounds on invariant manifolds, distortion bounds, uh, absolute continuity, and the growth of unstable manifolds. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, I mean, this, this method was applied in many papers, especially in the case of billiards, with uh, lots of success. And what we're going to do is kind of use the same uh, uh, schema with a little tweak. And why we are going to tweak it, it's because in my list of properties here, there is this kind of uniform curvature bounds, which is kind of annoying because when you talk about curvature, you need objects to be C2 smooth. In particular, the invariant manifolds, if I'm going to talk about curvature, they need to be C2 smooth. And the point is that they are not situ in our setting. So this was noticed by Bauman, Brie, and Burns in 87. So in particular for the profile that I wrote, one plus x to the power four, glued with something, they could prove that they are not situ at the closed geodesic. So you say, okay, you, you don't have the axioms for uh, of Chernoff, but fortunately in 99, Gerber and Wilk so noticed that it's not C2, but it's uniform C1 plus Lipschitz. And this is the right regularity to make the Chernoff scheme work. Because what he asked when he, he's talking about uniform curvature bounds, basically what he needs is a slow variation of the tangent planes in order to compute uh, uh, measures of sets coming from projections of the tangent space to the unstable manifolds. And to that, you don't need the curvature bound, but you just need to know a notion of upper bound on the curvature. So in other words, that the tangent planes are not varying too fast. And this is given by Lipschitz. So in other words, uh, even though we can't strictly apply uh, chain of axioms as written in the literature, it's not, it's not difficult to tweak them to include this slight generalization. And this is precisely the condition that we have for our examples. So we are saved by this work somehow of Gerber and Wilkinson. And now let me talk about, uh, yeah, so this is the comment that was made that curvature bounds is just to control variation of tangent spaces. And they, since he's just talking about upper bounds, deep sheet suffices. Okay, so now let me uh, talk about the axioms themselves and how to check them quickly. Uh, so I, yeah, in the remaining time, I don't want to waste your time on lots of details, but let me just check a few properties. So the idea is the following. You are going to believe me that I just need to construct my section and understand my maps close to the neck because outside the neck, the geodetic is just in negative curvature. So everything is fine. I just need to understand how transitions on the neck happen. <clears throat> and to do so, let, let me just take the example of crossing geodesics. So I'm not going to try to treat the, the, the bouncing ones, but the treatment is analogous. Let me just look at angles where you are crossing and coming out of on this side. And so my section, I mean, morally, but this is not true, but morally, the section that I'm going to take is just the following. I'm going to take these two curves here, alpha and beta. Then I can take some disks, SU disks here on, on, the, on this part. And this will be uh, my, my, my map, okay? So this is basically the cross section. I mean, it's not true. Uh, technically it's harder to do that, but morally what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that to build a map to check channel of axioms, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, to take the vectors based on alpha union beta. And so every time across I have a, a, a map and some disks outside just to complete the picture of the section. So this will be my map, but I'm going to analyze only the map from alpha to beta, say, just to give a feeling of what kind of estimate we have to do. Okay, so we are trying to analyze what happens from alpha to beta angle. <clears throat> and so I'm going to introduce some notation. So as I told you, I'm going to say from the left to the right, so minus one to one, and then I'm parameterizing this geodesic by some interval of time so minus TT, so that at time zero, I'm really crossing the geodesic in the middle. Okay, so this is the meaning of these conditions. And now I'm going to look at uh, geodesics whose clairo constant belongs to an uh, interval, which is 
pretty close to one. And it's given by uh, one plus, I mean, one over n plus one square and the one over n square. Okay, so I'm going to basically divide the set of Clairaut constants close to one into these intervals. And this decomposition, if you look at this, the way I'm doing this decomposition is very similar to billiards. And this is not a coincidence. We are really going to mimic what people do for billiards with, with the notion of what they call homogeneity bands. The idea is that we're trying to get uniform properties like uniform hyperbolicity, uniform distortion, uniform growth. And there is no hope to get that globally on the phase space. We have to concentrate on bands where guys kind of clo travel close together and they feel the same hyperbolicity, which gets degenerate when I approach Claro constant one, okay? So that's the idea. I'm not going to compare vectors which are too far. I'm just comparing guys in the same homogeneous band, which is this thing here. And so the first limit is that guys in the homogeneity band, they take almost the same time, about the same time to cross the neck. And the time, I mean, almost the same time means a time of order n to the power r minus two over r, where this approximation here is up to two multiplicative constants. So, but the exponent is correct. There is no loss in the exponents, okay? And this lemma is a calculation with Clairaut. I mean, you basically use the fact that the Clairaut is a constant of integration. So this allows you to basically talk about a problem on a first order differential equation, you integrate it to get out the time and you check that you get the correct expression. Okay, so it's a calculus exercise. But of course you see, I mean, this is intuitive. I mean, the, 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 the closer you get to the asymptotic, more time you travel because you spiral more and more for crossing and then getting back. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what is the Lebesgue measure of the set of vectors in a given homogeneity band? So the band is basically, so the, the, the measure is basically the set of this interval, which is one over two, one over n to the power three, okay? And what up, why I'm talking about that? Because this is kind of giving a control of tails of my tower. <clears throat> and so if you use these two facts, uh, you can see that the time, uh, I mean, the vectors is spending a long time in the neck. It's about uh, this series here, because you should sum over all homogeneity bands for which this number is bigger than your k to the power something. And this number is k to the power two. So if you change variables, the time, if you spend time n in the neck, then the measure of those vectors is uh, this one over n to the power r plus two over r minus two plus one, okay? And, and here you see the number that I was mentioning in my conclusion of my theorem. And so for the map, the tail is a kind of that number in the correlations plus one, which is normal. I mean, for the map, you get always a number plus one. We saw that in, in, in Zs lecture. For the map, you get a number plus one, and for the flow, we are going one less. And now we need to understand uh, the map. So the map here, you can explicitly calculate because of the symmetries of the situation. And so basically we know how much uh, you turn around in the theta variable along the geodesic. And of course you go from, min uh, from the circle minus one to the circle one. And then the angle that you get in is the same that you get out by symmetry of the situation because you, you end up, you wrap around, you cross the geodesic and then you can reverse the mechanical system. So you get out of the same angle. So the angle coordinate is not very difficult. It's just the theta coordinate that gets wrapped around. So on each band, you are basically twisting the angle by a quantity, which it depends on the angle of entrance. And this, the amount of twists is a function that you can control very well. And this is crucial. This is why we stick to rotation surfaces, uh, surface of revolution, because we can really compute this derivative. Uh, and there is no uh, error in the uh, error term in the power. It's really this guy up to two multiplicative constants. <clears throat> and for the second derivative, we just need an upper bound. But for the derivative, we need uh, very good bound. And this is why we stick it first two examples. 
but an important thing is that since you are, so basically this picture is the following, you approach the singular set and you twist more and more around this guy. So basically you're, you are kind of looking at a, a map of, of a surface, which is basically made of two components, a hyperbolic map, which is transitions in the negatively curved surface, and then a kind of parabolic map, a then twist, which is strength is bigger and bigger as you approach the singular set. And you're composing these maps, not randomly, but kind of composing them and trying to build a, a dynamical system, which is an iterated function system of these two things, hyperbolic map, infinite then twist. Somehow. Sorry, Mateus, what, what is yeah. it that is getting bigger and bigger as you approach the singularity? Ah, the this, uh, this, function, this function zeta, which is the twist that you do in the angular coordinate until you go out. out. I mean, the, 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 the number of turns that you are giving here in this picture. And, and this this explodes as, as what happens as you get, oh, as the direction becomes more, exactly. more vertical. Get, exactly, exactly. Uh -huh, uh -huh, it explodes uh -huh. and we can control in a very precise way how it explodes. And this is important for our estimates and to ensure hyperbolicity. And this is why we are sticking to examples uh, uh, so far, I mean, for the moment. Um, yeah, but this is the idea. And in particular, we can compute, for instance, how uh, unstable vectors grow. And we get this formula, which is basically, as I told you, coming from here. And so forth. So in particular, this gives a very nice uniform hyperbolicity. I mean, you, you expand at least by some amount, and this amount increases as you approach the singular set, the derivative explodes as you approach, which is good for expansion, I mean, and contraction. So you have this uniform hyperbolicity property. Um, then uh, you can also prove using similar bounds, since you have bounds on the derivative and second derivative, you can prove distortion bounds. <clears throat> and then uh, you can prove in particular, uh, yeah, that uh, the, the, the log of the derivative, it's varying like a holder function of the points. And this is because we can control the, co the logarithmic derivative. So the quotient of zeta two primes by zeta prime. <clears throat> okay. And so this one third here comes from the fact that the quotient is really n squared, if you divide here. <clears throat> and the interval where this happens is that the homogeneity band is n to the power minus three. And so the distortion is n squared by this to the, I mean, you, you need to give up this factor here to be able to make a big O there. So if you give up two thirds in the exponent, it remains a one third. And then uh, you can also prove uh, absolute uniform absolute continuity by the same means, okay? And again, I mean, I, we are using a uh, holder continuity of defoliation, which is not automatic. I mean, it's automatic in hyperbolic dynamics, but here we are again using Jobber Wilkinson. <clears throat> okay. They, they have two theorems, one's giving Lipschitz proper along the leaves and holder continuity if you move in any direction. And then, uh, as I told you, so these are let's say two axioms or three axioms, I mean, uniform hyperbolicity. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have not explained for you the growth lemma, but I said about uh, uniform uh, distortion and uniform absolute continuity. But yeah, you, you have more axioms to check, in particular I have to check that, uh, um, for instance, when you have the singular set corresponding to plural constant equals to one, uh, and then you need to check uh, complexity growth of the singular set. So when you iterate uh, and pre-iterate the set, the way it crosses and decomposes the phase space is not creating too many pieces <clears throat> and so forth. Uh, but yeah, but I think I'm not going to discuss it uh, because this discussion is technical uh, and especially because this discussion depends on a, a appropriate choice of this section, which I did not do today. I mean, I was doing the calculus with this fake section, which is just the next, but actually in, in reality, you have to adapt to that, decompose more and yeah, it's more technical, but 
So this is why I'm not going to discuss the other part because I'm not going to give the correct expression of the map. But uh, you can kind of believe that out of this calculation with Clairaut, we can get enough control on hyperbolic to get a map, a surface map with uh, a young tower with exponential towers. And now you need to pass this information to the flow, but to pass the information to the flow is the computation that we already did because I told you that transition time, so the time, so time to cross is this. I mean, the tail is this. I mean, the, the, the set of the measure of guys which take time n to cross the neck is about one over n to this constant plus one. And so if you convert that into the flow, you should take this one out and then you get the correct uh, um, the correct uh, decay of correlations. Well, it's not so easy. You have to apply, I mean, if you want to do it properly, you, you have to apply a recent work from 2019 by Ballant, Butterley and Melbourne, but let's say morally, that's what it is. And I think I'll stop here. So I'm taking your questions. So. Uh, thank you, grazie, obrigado, merci. So I try to say <laughs> thank you in the language of the organizers. And uh... <laughs> so let's thank Mateus. Thank you, Mateus. Thank you. Do you have questions or comments? Well, I have one more question, but I've been asking so many questions. So I don't know. Go ahead, Alina. It's it's really, I mean, um, I, I uh, it's really just about this last part about going to the flow. I've not, you know, I've, I've worked very little with flows. I did some work with Ian on the Lorentz equations, but I remember that the problem with the decay of correlations is that you need. I mean, uh, I remember that it's you, you need actually to show that the flow stretches somehow right it's not mm -hmm. just a, it's not just yeah. an automatic uh issue. Yeah, exactly i mean yeah. usually uh you need some conditions on um <clears throat> yeah some sort of stretching because you basically are trying to understand i mean when you do the um so let me show some correlation yes yeah, so like this one when you do the laplace transform what you see is a kind of exponential i uh, times a temporal function <clears throat> and then you want this function to oscillate a lot to be able to produce cancellations uh, and the in in our case and this is what i mean you can ensure for instance if you ask for the condition called uni uniform integrability of defoliations meaning if you do a path along the stable of epsilon size then unstable then stable and then what when and then unstable when you get back to the flow direction you get by a uh, distance of epsilon square say so the defoliations are not not only non integrable but they, they are non integrable in a quantitative way um, <clears throat> yeah so and this kind of no quantitative non integrability allows you to run this stretch of things and pass to the flow. But in our case, my claim is that this, this is automatic because we have a context structure. This is an argument that uh, goes back to, I mean, this kind of application of context structures to get statistical properties go back at least to a paper of Katok. And uh, it was used and reused by many persons. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm historically accurate in saying, but I, I remember clearly a paper by Katok doing that. Mm -hmm to get Bernoulli property. Yeah, and, and so here's the same. I mean, here we are taking advantage that we don't have to discuss much because our flow is already geodesic, so it's contact. So it, it suffices to know the tail. Yeah, but in general, you are absolutely right. We have a, if we had an abstract flow, we had also more work to do to check some right. pair of conditions, right. non-integrability conditions. Right. Okay, thank you. I wanted to make a comment that was not in the slides that the paper of passing from 77, it, it proves actually the Bernoulli property. Oh, that's not... right. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I started talking about the DC and yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It, no. It's like when I was telling about the Nozov that I just mentioned the DC, but yeah, you are actually mixing more. But there I was just focusing on. 
Yeah, there is another thing that I wanted to point out. Uh, this kind of infinite bent twist map that Mateo said is, is very hard to work with because you have a singular set and if you, have, if you get a curve that is transverse to the singular set, the image of this curve of which has finite length will actually be infinite because its image, it will rotate infinitely often and accumulate in a closed curve. So it makes it very complicated, the analysis, even for this complexity bounds, because you, you have to have like uh, no triple intersections, but you are dealing with uh, curves of infinite length and you don't know what happens when you perturb the boundary, what happens to this, the new images. So you have the perturbative argument that we make, uh, it's, it's not as standard as we thought. And actually we make many mistakes to get to the, to the right, uh, right way of uh, constructing the section. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so this is why I said that it's a, I, I, what I showed is a kind of fake cross section because the true cross section has to have to choose well the boundaries to ensure these transversality properties that are non-standard and it relies on the formula for the map really. So this is why we are sticking to the example because in, at least in the example, we control everything. So, I mean, of course we believe that this could be generalized, but uh, we are not yet there. <laughs> Do you have any other questions or comments? Okay, so let's uh, thank uh, Mateus again.